It's funny to think I haven't spoken on this subject yet. I guess it's because uh, I just take it for granted. And it's just part of life, really. So I don't think of it being interesting to other people so much, but it is actually. So uh, this video is about the magic tradition in Ireland. Now, the magical tradition in Ireland can be distinguished into two specific branches. There's ceremonial magic that takes place basically, well, not so much now, but would have been very popular with the Anglo-Irish ascendancy. These would have been people who were descendant of English settlers and Norman families that came starting in the Middle Ages to the Elizabethan period and who settled in Ireland and were originally Catholics and after the Reformation some would have been converted, many would have converted, most would have converted to Presbyterianism and then it would have also been Protestant wealthy planters coming from England mostly and also Scotland but mostly England. Now their magical tradition is what gave us the likes of the Golden Dawn. This would be the magic of William Butler Yeats, Bram Stoker, Lady Wilde, and it was very connected to Irish Freemasonic magic. So off the bat there, you can see that it, or Irish Freemasonic occultism. Off the bat there, you can see that it's, it's, it's an upper class thing. It's a, well, middle class, upper middle class and up thing. Uh, still not really that powerful or practiced anymore. Basically, because the, the the families that did it didn't lost their power in Ireland, so they don't have like in the south of Ireland. The Anglo Irish tradition has basically lost its power. It was very powerful and ran the country until independence, and Catholics were basically second class citizens in Ireland. And, and still war for even after independence in places like Dublin. Like there was many companies that Irish, famous Irish companies, you know, like Guinness and Jemison that would not give senior jobs to Catholics. And uh, they were, and you know, Irish distilleries, they, all, the, all that, the Catholics were basically, for, they weren't banned, but they wouldn't get jobs in senior management or technical jobs. The same thing happened to things like in Belfast and with Harland and Wolf Shipyard. The Catholics were basically the bottom of the, the rung. Now, so that power base was lost in Ireland and it transformed in Northern Ireland into things such as the Orange Order and Orange Lodges. And it lost its esoteric aspect and became something akin to a Christian Presbyterian Freemasonry. In the south of Ireland, it evolved into the power systems, the ones that didn't lose their power, and it quietly dissipated into Irish society. And you still have the uh, the Golden Dawn is still very active in places like Dublin, and there are still magic circles that would cater to that culture around the country. Uh, a lot of them have evolved into Wicca, believe it or not, into Wiccan covens, particularly in rural areas. Now, that's that's once that's that's the, probably the most famous, the world famous Irish magical tradition is the the the, the thing that gave us the Golden Dawn. Even though the Golden Dawn started with McGregor's Mathers in in London and stuff like that, it really was very heavily uh, influenced by these Irish occultists such as William Butler Yeats who brought the folk magic of the Irish stately home into into it. Now the other side of this would be the the, the rural folk traditions. Now there there is I grew up in a very working class inner city Dublin background and I don't really remember much of that kind of thing when I was young. There was superstitions and folk traditions and there were stories of certain like there was there was things like uh, legends surrounding kind of urban fairies like in central Dublin there was a, a fairy uh, kind of a demon called the Dotchler who was like a giant pig who stalked the streets at night and there was things like that there was all kind there was like the the black church on the north side of the city which is a very ominous looking building. If you in if you ran around it three times at midnight, the devil would appear. This kind of thing was but that's not unique to that. 
uh, when the, my primary introduction to it was my grandmother. Her family came from the Irish Midlands. They were real bog people. And from there, she really did believe in all that stuff. The, 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 uh, the fairies, the, the banshee. And, you know, she, she carried that to the rest of her life. She really did believe all that stuff. And so that was my first introduction to that. Uh, then, you know, as you grow up, you go camping and stuff like that. And I had a jo one of my first jobs. I was traveling around Ireland an awful lot. And uh, you would end up in rural areas and you would hear, like, I would always ask people, can you tell me, like, a ghost story from the area? And that kind of was how my introduction to it started. Now, so what we're talking about, what we're talking about here for the rest of the remainder of this video is Irish folk magic. Now, there's an assumption that it all goes back to the Druids and pre-Christian times. Yes, a lot of it does, but it's evolved like all magical traditions through the centuries. So not only has it picked up Christian archetypes and stuff like that, but it has changed according to the functioning of the society and how it operates. Uh, often with catastrophic uh, results, I might add. Now, the majority of Irish folk magic today, and I live in a semi-rural area, and it's still very strong, is healing. It's about healing. It's nearly all based on folk healing and cures. And you will often hear an expression that when someone say you talk about people like, oh, that guy John down the road, that guy Sean over there, that woman Mairead up the road, uh, Bridget or Sinead who lives across by the lake, they have the cure for this and the cure for that. What that means is they have an ability to cure illnesses that only they have. So, for instance, I told you a story of my friend that had, uh, had burns on her leg and a neighbor who had licked a, a lizard had spoken to him on the bog one day uh, and he's not mad or anything he's a normal young guy uh, had licked the lizard and the lizard get, told him that he would have the the power now to cure burns so you get a lot of that kind of thing and he now he, he doesn't get paid for it but he helps people deal with burns and rashes and skin disorders and yes he has a hundred percent um success rate where that comes from you could say it's psychosomatic you could say it's all kind of things the fact is it works a very common thing is cure for babies' conditions, such as colic. Colic is a big problem, with, not big problem, it's a problem for babies in the west of Ireland. There are lots of folk traditions. A common one is to put a piece of string that's been blessed uh, in a baby's mouth and then pull the string out and the string takes the colic. And that has, I've, I have numerous friends whose babies have been cured that way of colic where doctors and pills and things didn't work. Now, that's an interesting one because while a baby's not conscious or aware enough to know a newborn baby to be aware of something that would trigger a psychosomatic healing, like a placebo effect. So there's definitely something magical going on there outside the domain of normal cog cognition in terms of conscious awareness. You get a lot. Now, another a huge aspect of Irish folk magic that has come back in recent years is wells. And this is probably the most apparent return to paganism that we have in modern Ireland. When I was growing up, there was the holy wells were only visited by very religious people who collected the holy well water. And again, using for blessing houses, sanctifying and this kind of thing. These waters have a very high mineral content, has a lot to do with it as well. And they were pulling up minerals from the center of the air to have a very pure, clean water. The country is covered in these holy wells and people swear by them. Some of them are ornate and decorated. Not to the extent of the one that I showed you in the video on St. Winifred's Well in Flintshire and Wells on, in, in, in Wales on my Beyond Room 313 channel. But you, if you go there, most of the names carved into the wall are people who traveled from Ireland, even as far as this part of Ireland into the walls 200 years ago this is how seriously taken the power of a holy well or a sacred well is done in Ireland of course these go back to the druids holy was holy well and there's always holly trees around them 
on these holly trees, it was traditional in the past to tie a piece of white paper or a rag with a wish on it. When I was growing up, that tradition was practically dead. There was no one doing it. Nowadays, you see this everywhere. Not only at holy wells, but this pagan tradition of tying the white rag to a holly or a hawthorn branch is everywhere. Just Creevy Keel up the road here, which is a megalithic site and also a, a place was strongly associated with the fairies until the, the archaeologists from Harvard in the 1940s excavated it. A very interesting place was not very, you know, was reported for what we would have been called UFO activity and stuff like that back in the day, what we call that now. It is the, the hawthorn bushes leading to and from the site are covered in white rags and white pieces of paper. And also, I see it at Glencar Waterfall, which is where the Yeats poem, The Stolen Child, is set. That's just up the road here. Come away, O human child, to the waters and the wild, with a fairy hand in hand, for this world is more full of weeping than you can understand. And that's the site of that. And that place is now covered in rags on the so to the point where the, the council have to every go up every so often and clean them off and take them off because there's, there's, li there's literally the hawthorn bushes and the holly bushes are a sea of white sometimes at the end of the summer. So the well tradition is very important. So you have the water tradition, very, very important. Uh, the healing tradition, very important. Now where does cursing come into this? Cursing was epidemic in Ireland at one time. So much so that I kind of believe it may have caused the famine. You literally had families cursing each other in small rural areas over things like land ownership. Now, interestingly enough, that all died off in Ireland with the mass emigration to America and Canada and England in the years following the famine. That same tradition, because Scotland is basically Scotland was is basically an invention of Ireland. It was it was part it was a kingdom in the north of Ireland called Delrada, about eighteen hundred years ago, and it also extended into a huge section of Western Scotland. That's why it's the Scots speak Irish. They call it Gaelic. It's Gaelic, and this is they 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 in the Western Isles of Scotland. There's a lot of the repository of the Irish magic prior famine survived there. So you have a, a strong tradition of cursing. I have a couple of antiquated books on Scottish cursing and they're, they're very interesting because Scotland was not affected. But however, remember the Highland clearances, you do wonder about that too. This is why the thing of cursing and cursing and cursing can actually damage a society. This is the problem with Haiti. And so it's, I, there's the curses and hexes like, for instance, I go to Italy a fair bit, and that part of the world is still big there. It's still big in Sri Lanka. And um, in Sicily, it's huge. And um, it's died off here, mainly because those communities were wiped out in the famine, or they emigrated to America, Canada, Australia, and so on. And they took those things there. I'm hoping to go to uh, uh, to Newfoundland at some point in the next few years, and it is to, to, to try and interview because there's still a strong pre-famine Celtic, Gaelic, Irish culture in rural areas there that has maintained itself. And uh, they see themselves as Irish and they even speak with Irish. Like, they, have, like, they have like West of Ireland, Kerry or West Cork type accents, even though they're, they've been there since the famine. To nearly 200 years, going on 167 years now. Now... The, the cursing thing kind of died off. It it didn't. It's gone. Yeah, I've, I, I'm not aware of anyone in Ireland that I know. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. That's ever cursed anyone else. I just I can't remember an ant talking about it, or anything like that. Now this brings us to the final part of this, and this is also to do with the rural folk magic. Fairies are central to Irish magic tradition. Now, when an American hears a fairy. From the kind of mainstream normie point of view, they think of things like Tinkerbell and, you know, sweet little fairies like that or that kind of thing. In the uh, spiritual or the New Age or the, uh, the wicked thing, they talk about the Fae. The Fae are not Irish fairies. There's no Fae in Ireland. The Fae are 
English fairies. They're in the English fairy tradition and they're very different than what we have in Ireland, which is called the she. S-I-D-H-E. That's how it's spelled, spelled and it's pronounced she. And that's where Banshee comes from. The White Fairy and this kind of thing. You'll have a uh, Lee Annan She. You'll have the She, and you'll have lots of places in Ireland with the t- name She in it. Where the, the, the townland I live in is the Hill of the Fairy. This kind of thing. It's you see She everywhere, everywhere in Ireland, and this means the you know Glen She, the the the, the Valley of the Fairies up the road in Donegal, a very mystical place. And there's a beautiful Irish song called "The Lass of Glen She" about that. Now, when you talk about the Irish and the fairies, you're talking about a kind of a demonology. The she are not like the fairies in, in they say, the, the Anglo tradition, the fae. They're very different. They're nasty. They're often very hostile to human beings. And Irish people will go to extreme lengths to avoid them. Even in rural areas today, I was talking to a lady in a restaurant the other night and, you know, her daughter's a scientist. Uh, She just graduated university. They own two successful businesses. To this day, she will not do anything that involves annoying the fairies. Now, you could say the fairies are a metaphor for disrupting the natural order of things. But these people absolutely believe, even if they don't believe the fairies are beings, they believe in fairy courses. There are still roads in this country to this day that the National Roads Authority will be building a motorway or a dual carriageway or a brand new road, an intersection. (coughs) And someone will mention, you can't build there because there's a fairy tree on it. Usually that's a hawthorn standing alone. Or there was a fairy fort there. Or the fairies passed through there. And the National Roads Authority will still to this day just like in Iceland, and that's also you know this. You see, Americans and others think when they hear people like talk the Irish talk about like the, the elves or the fairies or the Icelandics talking about the elves that we're somehow backward and we're not very sophisticated. These both Ireland and Iceland are very sophisticated modern societies, but they still believe this. It's still a fact of a fact that's taken on board. Now the roads authority will divert the road or the junction. And they won't say we did it because of fairies. They will say things like local, cultural, or for historic reasons, we've diverted the road. That's what they'll say. But that's what it is, fairies. And if you go to the National Roads Authority website, you will actually see those things mentioned in road planning applications. That, and that usually is someone nearby saying you can't build there because there'll be road traffic crashes on there. Very connected to the idea of the crossroads. My house is haunt, is not haunted. I haven't seen anything like that. Any any magical activity that's happened in my place, I brought myself through my own work. It belonged to a witch, and it's on a crossroads, and she was a Presbyterian woman who was uh, disliked by the local Catholic population because she had a lot of money, and she hexed them. Now, the, he- the house that I live on, the crossroad is now only three roads. The third road goes into my backyard and into a forest behind where there's a holy well. And that's, uh, I've maintained that as a fairy path. And I've never seen anything there. But behind that is an ancient cemetery with a bog. And when I first moved to the place, one night I saw these black figures moving across the bog. I did ghosts, fairy, it doesn't matter. They were there. I didn't analyze it. People take all that stuff. I'm surrounded by fairy forts and all that kind of thing. But everywhere in Ireland, there's 40,000 of them. Just that, just think about that. Ireland's the size of Maine. There's 40,000. Now, the fairies, like in demonology, are, can actually be captured and used as employment. There is, there is a certain type of fairy that's stupid, and it lives it it, it lives in farms and it, in, in and around farm buildings, and uh, mooching. That means like trying to get free stuff. It, they're thieves and stuff like that. And this fairy can be captured and trained to do things like braid horses, clean out barns. It's almost and they'll do it for certain types of food and things like this. I know this sounds mad. But this is where the tradition of leaving like this, the cakes out for Santa Claus. They leave food out for the fairies. And the fa- food disappears. And you can say a cat or a, a raven or something got them. But they really believe this. And uh, it caused, you know, this is so... When you talk about fairies in the Irish 
magical rural tradition, you're talking about something very, very close to demonology. Okay, it's the same idea, the same thing, the same of a heart, and that you some you don't go anywhere near like the Lian and the and she. Now, in Irish artistic traditions, going back to poets, painters, bards, the Lian and she is a female fairy that enters into your life as a beautiful, sexy muse. You devote your poetry, your painting, your art, your sculpture to her as you're having the best sex of your life. Uh, but the sex is draining your life force because she's vampiric. She's a vampire. And you will die young, but you will gain immortality through your great art. She gives you the gift of artistic greatness You'll have the best sex possible, uh, but you will die young, but your mortality, your immor- so you see, it's a summon, it's almost like a summoning. The, he, he, embarks on the, he embarks on the artistic process, right? He becomes very drawn into his art. Uh, in Ireland, it's generally things like uh, traditionally bardic arts, poetry, cr- writing music, this kind of thing. The Leanne and she appears as a beautiful woman, uh, he meets one day and she becomes his a scarlet woman for all intents and purposes, or maybe as a high priestess for all intents and purposes. Now, you could say that she targets him. I th- tend to see it that he has summoned her. He has summoned her. Now, you can... The problem is, if you get the Leanne and she as an artist to you, again, it's magic because... If you fall in love with her, it's just like allowing a demon to take control of your of your magical process. Remember, I've often told you in demonology, under no circumstances do you acquiesce your power uh, and authority to a demon. You treat them like absolute fucking shit. You totally impose upon them that they are not... Because if they get anything, any any chance of getting into your consciousness they will do it the same thing with the Elian and she you're you're an artist you meet this gorgeous beautiful woman you fuck the shit out of her you enjoy it sexually but you don't fall in love if you fall in love and this is what happens she will start draining your psychic life force that's why she targets young sensitive artists or to look at it another way it's a because it's a symbiotic uh, by locational thing and sort of like quantum entangle thing he draws her in I have never had a Leanne and she in a relationship I have seen them I have seen them walking the streets of places like Galway City stunningly beautiful women in their 20s and early 30s long jet black hair steely blue eyes perfect gorgeous figures walking with a sense of authority and arrogance about them and literally wait i've seen them at night time mostly you would today call them a goth chick although even in the old days they would have dressed in black very sultry and they do exist is it's 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 not a human she's not human uh, I'm not putting her down, but she's not, and you will see them. You will, and you'll never. You will. Uh, you will. Everyone will tell you in places like Galway City that they always saw a girl that looked like that. She's just walking down the street, just fucking stunning. Oh my god, I just wanted to shag her. You know, couldn't stop thinking about her. And they asked him, "Whatever happened to her?" And they go, "I don't know. Did you ever get married?" I don't know. I don't. I don't know. She just. I guess she just moved away. She was never there. She was there for one purpose. So that's. When you talk about the fairy faith in Ireland, you're talking about something that's a real, it's a real folk religion, very close to demonology like you would get in the Goetia. And there's all kinds of localized and national rural traditions for dealing with different types of fairies that has been cultivated from maybe thousands of years of interaction and the same thing applies with the elves in Scandinavia, well, particularly in 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 uh, Iceland. But you will get in places like Finland with the and uh, northern S- Norway and Sweden with the, the Sami people. Uh, so it's it's this is what Irish folk magic is basically like. 
it's if you look at everything every, like everywhere it's the same thing but different local terminologies based on things like the climate the culture the how the country looks and feels and its artistic and musical traditions and that's what the irish magical tradition is basically in a nutshell a lot of fairy fate a lot of sacred water type things r- ceremonies all about curing almost no hexing or binding of courses today which is a big shock that when a lot of somebody's wiccans move to ireland think they're going to be like pa- doing all this irish magic that's going to be all about things like that and then they find that it's really all about curing and helping people and uh and that's basically it. That's the Irish magical tradition in a nutshell. It's it will always be here. It'll never go away. I, I, I just want it just won't. It will always come back and it'll always be here. It will always evolve. But uh it's it's a reflection of the Irish nature. The Irish nature is not very intense. We're uh, we you hear these things about the Irish being, you know, uh the fighting Irish and all this nonsense. Now, the Irish are are not an aggressive people if, until you push them, and then they'll they'll destroy you. They, you know, that's the Irish nature. The, the, we don't go looking for fights, but if you come, there's a we will deal with it for so often, and then all that there won't be any flesh on your bones afterwards. That's what we're like. We're very easy going. Uh, we're very laid back, and we're not particularly driven by things like vendettas. We tend to be apathetic that way. Uh, the whole thing that like you hear me say, fuck them if they can't take it. That's the Irish way. Whatever, you know. Move on. Do something productive. And you get that. You don't, So, you, you know, it, in places like Sicily or parts of Spain, Mexico, the parts of the Caribbean, where... And the Irish are, are different than, say, like the other Nord. We are, you know, we do have a strong Iberian... Uh, rain. A strong Iberian genetic aspect to us from the migration in the Bronze Age of people from what is now Portugal and Spain into Ireland, and so we do have that, but we're not we don't have that we don't have that intensity like you get in in in, in say in Sicily where the, the magic tradition there is it's it's you know it's oh you know the 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 coven that I work with in Turin they're originally from Sicily and uh, there I know Turin is in northern Celtic. Uh, Italy, the the culture there is it has that Sicilian. Oh, it was like trapped in within that Germanic Celtic part of Ger of Italy. That you can you know it's intense. Uh, so magic in a tradition will reflect that. It will reflect that intensity of the culture. You know, and cultures do change. Remember that. I think uh, because Ireland was never conquered militarily by the Romans in the sense that the Romans arrived here with legions and set up um, you know cities and all that stuff like they did in England the Celtic tradition pre-Christian has managed to survive through the fairy fate where in England you have the fairy tradition uh, exists really only in places of Celtic England in Cornwall and Devon you have the Pixie and you also have a similar things in Wales, uh, but Wales was very co- heavily conquered by the Romans, and but Cornwall and parts of Devon weren't the West Country, and you will have the magic tradition there kind of died off because of the Reformation and Presbyterianism. So in many ways, Ireland is kind of like a a living museum of the kind of magic that may have been practiced thousands of years ago in northern europe and it's not as intense now regarding the final thing i want to say is there an irish shamanistic tradition absolutely where the druid shamans they probably were at one time but by the time of the roman empire the late iron age they had definitely moved into a, a more of an administrative a uh, genealogical spiritual counseling element which continued on in Ireland after for hundreds of years well, 1500 years after Christianity with the what were called the phila it was a bardic tradition uh, the sham- Irish shamanic tradition was called the fairy doctors now the fairy doctors again you see see fairies are central to it 
The fairy doctors were shamans who went around the country curing people of mental illness. And what they did was, was shamanic things. They would find someone, say a young man who was very depressed, and keep him awake for 48 hours. 24 hours of that dancing. And you would say to yourself, well, what does that do? He would bring him to the land of the fairies through a dance. See, that's, that's shamanism. So it would change the neurochemicals, the, the dancing in his brain. His serotonin, melatonin le layers, levels would change. His oxytonin levels would change. His things like uh, his adrenaline would, would decrease and his norepinephrine. Things that cause you to make difficulty to get out of deep depression. Uh, true ex this is why people who suffer from depression or go to like mosh pits and heavy metal gigs and speed metal and extreme metal and all that. It's to change, it's a temporarily, but the fairy doctors, because they went further, they invoked and they would stay, in, and this is what they did. And what the, when the rise of medical science came along in Ireland, in the, 18, in the years following the famine, it was really bizarre. They built citadels of, of asylums. The asylums that were built in Ireland are, if you ever come to Sligo, I'll show you one, it's now a hotel. It, this thing was... And they're all over the country. They look like massive castles. They're like something. They're almost designed to be as terrifying as possible. They're like sets from a Hammer horror film. You're waiting for Dracula to come out of them. Christopher Lee. They're stone monoliths, and they were the horrors that were inflicted upon them as they were being built. And the psyche. What was the the mental health industry was in formation, 1860s, 1870s. A vicious war began on the fairy doctors. They were called devil worshippers by the Protestants. They were called... It's this Tempest here today. They were called evil uh, rip-off merchants, uh, swindlers, and all this kind of thing. But yet they had a tradition going back forever. So that was They were directly connected from the Irish shamanistic tradition. would have been very common to the good walkers, the Bernadette of the northern Italian Slavonic world. Uh, the curing of a culture or a family or an individual through nighttime dancing and uh, the, the classic shamanic transportation into the fairy world, the spirit world, the demon world, whatever. So that's it. That's the Irish magic tradition. Unfortunately, the shamanic elements have been lost. Uh, well, they'll probably come back in some other form. The Irish magic is traditionally is surviving and flourishing without the need for uh, external influences. We don't need anything like uh, an organizational structure and so on because it's a very personal, individual thing. People who have magic powers in Ireland, in rural Ireland, are considered central to the community because we're a Catholic country, mostly, uh, in the, and especially in rural areas. There is no prohibition on um, sorcery that you would get in the Protestant areas. Like I told you, the only places Ireland where witches have ever been born or persecuted in Ireland were in Puritan Presbyterian areas, such around Kilkenny and... Uh, West East Cork, Yole, and then wherever only where Puritans were, and the Catholics have no problem with magic. That's why magic has flourished in Catholic areas, and uh, so it's never going to be persecuted or go away. And like I said, even intelligent, educated people, if they see know someone who instantaneously cures a baby of colic, they may would justify it and say, "Oh, it's you know." It's uh, it's just, it's a trick. It's a trick. But it worked. I'm happy it worked. The baby's better. But uh, I know fellows who are atheists and they, 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 they you still see them going down. They'll go, I'm an atheist. They're all bollocks. They will still go down to the holy well to get the bottle of water for their mother or for even for their family or themselves. And they'll say, ah, I'm just doing it for tradition. And that's why Irish folk magic survived. Take care.